Hi, I'm Bob Fisher, guest hosting for Dave Gilmore, and this is Design Intelligence. You'd be hard-pressed to find an architect or design professional who believes their clients understand and will pay for the true value of design. As part of our series called Designing Value, we'll be talking to leading thinkers about how we define and communicate the value of design to provide actionable insights to apply in practice. Our guest today is Kai Uwe Bergman. Kai is a partner at the Bjarke Ingels Group, also known as BIG. He heads the Business Development Office, which is active in over 40 countries. He also oversees BIG's urban development projects and supports the firm's landscape practice. On this edition of This is Design Intelligence, he talks about what inspired him to become an architect, why he believes every project he designs needs to provide something to the community that is not yet there, and the forgotten opportunity where design professionals can provide value. Welcome to this edition of This is Design Intelligence, conversations with leadership voices in the built environment. Hello, everyone. Today, we have Kai Uva Bergman, who is a global partner at Bjarke Ingels Group. Kai, welcome to This is Design Intelligence. Thank you very, very much. We're really glad to be here. I'm just curious, what inspired you to become an architect? <laughs> it probably goes uh, as many stories uh, start uh, with that first batch of Legos that you receive as a child. And uh, you create sort of an infinite number of worlds with a finite number of pieces. And I, I still actually have them at home now, which my two children are able to, uh, to do the next generation of form making with, uh, with them. I don't know if any organization in the world has done more for the profession of architecture than Lego, <laughs> except for maybe people who made the Erector set, if you remember that, which is a little bit more old school. Yeah, of course. So you, you kind of got fascinated with building things when you were a kid, and, and how did that path go from you know, that moment of inspiration all the way to where you are today? Well, I think my... My parents probably had a lot to do with it, too, in that uh, we as a family took any time that was uh, left over from the holidays, uh, even in between sort of uh, schoolings to uh, really travel and see the world. And I, re I remember clearly also being as awestruck by the churches and the castles that I would see on my travels through Europe. Or the wide expanses and the and the sort of landscapes of North America, traveling from national park to national park, and just really being in awe of uh, both uh, buildings, uh, cities, and how they then also connect with or spare the landscapes around them. So, how did you originally envision? design as helping people? Like, when did you start to understand the ways that design and architecture could be of benefit to people? I would say, even in my studies, I was very omnivorous, uh, meaning that I took a lot of classes outside of a typical architecture program and uh, courses such as biomedical ethics. Um, I remember uh, taking uh, classes in in theater and uh, set design, as well as in the uh, sort of history uh, programs, oftentimes history is marked by kind of physical manifestations within those historical epochs. People's lives revolved very much around the spaces that they were in. I think those other courses, uh, learning the value of, of history or anthropology, and then learning how there are a, a variety of ways of interacting with architecture and, and trying to think about that public responsibility was very much born out of, out of all of those interests. It sounds like a very multi-layered view of the value of design. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly was something that I think my, again, my parents and my upbringing uh, was also very important in sort of uh, seeding. I uh, came to America uh, when I was six years old. So I, I pretty much have grown up in the United States, uh, having come from Germany. And, you know, just the, the sort of growing up in the school system here and 
going to university, uh, both in Virginia and in the UC system out in Los Angeles, there was just an incredible amount of opportunities that these kind of campuses and schools afforded you. Uh, I did graduate after six years of of, uh, architectural studies, still feeling that I had not necessarily been prepared for the profession. So I I added actually another two years of apprenticeships afterwards so that I could learn how to work with different materials. So in what ways did you feel like you needed additional preparation? Was it in the technical practice of architecture or was it more in the business of architecture? What what did you feel like you still needed to learn? <laughs> I, I think it's one of those wonderful professions where you actually never know everything. You are continuously learning, even as you practice architecture, and you're always adding new skill sets. So it was actually in university where my interest on the business side actually grew at UCLA simply by the fact that the business school was across from the architecture school at the time, the Anderson Business School. And as I said, I I, I really enjoyed taking different types of courses. So I took entrepreneurship, uh, consumer behavior. I took, uh, there was a class that just had sort of, I think, a dozen CEOs from different uh, types of organizations just telling their story. And that really, that side of business is something that was born in uh, in, in those two years at UCLA and that's never left. So that is something that I, I carry even to this to this moment of just being interested in the business side of creativity uh, and how to create as wide of a framework for for uh, creativity to to exist and to flourish. But uh, I felt in the same breath that a lot of school is, of course, theoretical, and you're you're designing and building out of you know cardboard and balsa wood. And um, I felt that real buildings were built out of all these different materials that I knew very little about. So I spent those two years of apprenticing in wood and adobe in stonework in glass blowing, so that that would sort of deepen my knowledge of how to speak to craftsmen and and manufacturers. Well, and and just getting a sensitivity to materials uh, as kind of the building blocks, if you'll forgive the pun of you know, what you would design in the future. Yeah, very much still from the sort of Lego, uh, you know, a finite number of, of building blocks. Now I just expanded that to all of these different materials and, and and really learning, you know, what does glass in a curtain wall do and and how is it manufactured and what are you looking for for like the best quality versus lowest quality. And and that, again, has, is I think, really helped me. It, it prolonged the educational part of my development, but it certainly has helped me throughout my my career. So when you were talking about being so close to the business school and being interested in business, uh, that struck me as unusual because there are so many designers out there who seem to think that business and design, especially more forward-thinking design, are antithetical. But it doesn't sound like you believe that. I don't. I, I do think that when you look at success, even in the past, that that success is very often also showing success in decision making, uh, success in uh, teamwork, um, and you know I I once uh, learned that Michelangelo was not just a single artist uh, doing everything under the sun that is attributed to him. He had up to 150 or more uh, apprentices, and so in order for Michelangelo to really be able to run a business as well as the art and the incredible output that he accomplished in his lifetime, everything from architecture to sculpture to the Sistine Chapel, in order for him to actually have had that success and to make these incredible uh, contributions, they were all done within the kind of school of Michelangelo. And I think I I became very interested in just how one is able to create that kind of environment, both in terms of the business side and contractual side, but also in terms of just how to get 
a lot of people working together and and really to to create much more than you could ever create on your own. Yeah, it's it's how to create a culture of creativity, right? Very much so. Yeah, and I think that's one important thing that we forget uh, in, when we think about history, uh, whether it's the history of architecture or the history of art, we think of these heroes who are responsible for these you know, iconic creations. And in fact, uh, they were very much like people today uh, who lead firms. You know, They might provide direction, they might set a standard, they might demonstrate the way to do things, but ultimately it does take a whole team of people. Yeah. And glass blowing is another really great place to learn this is that uh, it's very difficult, almost impossible to be a, a sole glass blower, blowing artist, uh, just because the technique requires a lot of people to do different parts. So, um, you know, learning how to work within a team and to trust each other and to build, you know, through practice and through experience, a way of working together. I find those skills learned on the floor of a hot shop really are the same skills that you have here in a studio. And you worked for Dale Chihuly for a while, didn't you? Yeah, that I just actually, just this past week, uh, spent three days in Seattle where I got to see uh, him again. He's I would count him as one of my biggest mentors in my life. And just, he, he continues to work and he still has, you know, 60, 70 people working at the boathouse. And it's just remarkable to uh, to see that kind of creative energy. So what did you learn from Dale about the value of a creative product or the value of design? One of the key parts, and this is actually one of communication. So uh, Dale very early on realized that when he's showing his work in a gallery, it would reach the sort of, you know, few dozen people who come to the gallery and are interested in the actual work or are physically in Seattle or wherever the gallery happens to be. And he realized that an image of uh, the work uh, could then be, you know, basically shown in a newspaper. And then it would reach the the sort of, you know, maybe uh, thousands of people who read the newspaper and would then see something about the gallery opening or would be interested in coming to see it. And then he also created his own publishing uh, house and he would then place the same photograph in a book that would then sell for many years and then tens of thousands of people see the work. So there was a sort of scale of communication that he very quickly learned that if you are interested, this is not for everybody, but if you are interested in communicating your ideas broadly, then learning how, what's the scale of touching people and, and having them see your work grows exponentially by the medium that you use. You know, that's again, an artist, that's a fine artist and, you know, who's not afraid to publish even his own books in order to engage with the general public. And that's why I think there are still so many people that are interested in, in the work and, and, and one way to get to a broader public. Well, it's interesting because you don't always think of fine artists as being interested in engaging the general public rather than, let's just say, a certain small segment of collectors. Tim yeah, I think that, that that's where Dale also, I think, once said to me that he is much more interested in having someone that would spend $10 to go to the ballpark to see a ball game instead spend $10 to come see a museum exhibit than he is in just seeing the same museum people uh, coming to the same shows because he was very interested in expanding art to a broader cross-section of, of society. Is that a sensibility that's shared at BIG? I would say that in some ways, the way that we communicate our work is to make that work accessible to a larger populace, uh, also folks who may not necessarily be into you know, knowing architecture or knowing how a building is built. And so I, I would say that there's some parallels, although it's, it's entirely different 
from uh, Dale and, and what his intentions were. I just think that we are interested in having many people being able to relate. The more people that can actually communicate their needs and their desires and their wishes make actually the work that you're working on that much more informed and that much better. So in other words, the more that you, the more that you know, the more that you can make a project do. Yeah. I would even say the more that you engage, the more informed, the more loved, the more malleable or flexible a project can be to the different needs of, of that community. A great example of that is the Big U project here in New York to help uh, New York against uh, sea level rise. That's a project that you know we have held, I would say, hundreds of community meetings to hear and listen to what the community needed so that we could actually design something that fits in to, uh, to, their, to those needs, as well as protecting the community against something like climate change. So when you are working on a project within the firm, how explicit are you in conversations about the ways in which that project or your solution creates value and who it creates value for? Yorke, I think, puts it best in uh, Form Giving, which is the, the, the last publication we've put out, and it also was an exhibition, giving form to the future, which is not yet there. And that's, you know, the role of the architect is to not necessarily just design something that, you know, has already been made or that, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a kind of formulaic effort. Uh, it's really to design the future as we want it to be. And in so doing, giving in a way a gift back to society. Each and every project that we design for Bjarke needs to provide some value, needs to provide some something that is not yet there to the community, because that will then be what is actually, that's how the, the project's success is in a way valued. Yeah. The trick is it's not just your vision for what it should be, right? It's, it's also the needs and the desires and the hopes and the wishes of all the people in the community. It is. It's listening. It's in a way prioritizing those. It's a feedback loop. So it's doing it multiple times. I think in, in many ways, we're like curators who are curating the kind of public engagement. Sometimes that engagement is limited to the city or to uh, you know clients and stakeholders uh, that are more limited. Uh, and then still you have the responsibility of understanding the community's needs in those cases. And then it's really uh, finding ways you know, I, I'll use this as an example. We are just putting the finishing touches on the spiral high rise here in New York, uh, which is in Hudson Yards. When we conceived it, this goes back about 10 years ago, um, it was conceived as, you know, a single terrace on every single floor of an office building. And at the time that we designed it, we designed it right across from the High Line. And we even said it's the high line going into the skyline with this series of, of open terraces all the way to the top of the building. That seemed excessive to many people in the, um, in the real estate world. Why would you ever need a terrace on every single floor? Now in a post-COVID world where outdoors has just gained in value, the access to going outside, the, the fresh air quality uh, of bringing fresh air into the building, all of these things are now actually desired. That was not the case, you know, seven, eight years ago when this was getting permitted. But that's where, where I think that we have the ability to kind of not, you know, anticipate the future, but we can certainly project it and we can have different ideas and iterations of it. Then there are situations like 
COVID or something that we can't even foresee that will have profound effects on, on all buildings around us. Absolutely. So one of the things that strikes me in the example you just gave and in so many of your other projects is that there's this wonderful carving out of space for individuals. Like if you look at a lot of your housing projects, a lot of them have to do with creating these unique experiences for each unit in the building, like for each occupant. And then you can see it in the forms that you choose and in the way that you choose to lay out, you know, buildings together, even as early as the, uh, what was your first, what was your first residential building? Uh, it would be the VM houses and the mountain in uh, Copenhagen. Right. And I remember uh, the way that you put all of the units together was so that you could have this high density and privacy all at the same time. Yeah. Again, I think there is partly sort of history. Le Corbusier was working very similarly on the Unité de Habitation, on density, yet also creating intimacy. And he also created these uh, internal streets, they were called. And they would you know, be wider than your typical hallway. And then you would access these maisonette uh, apartments either on the left or right of the, of the corridor. And so you either go in left and up and all the way across the building, or you go in right and down and all the way across the building. So you actually access three floors from this wider corridor in the middle. And by doing so, when you consider a double loaded corridor on all three floors, which is typical, uh, you're actually using more area in the corridors on the typical project than on the uh, Unité de Habitación or what we also then iterated off of and riffed off of in the VM house. It's counterintuitive because you're actually widening the corridor to a much more pleasant width in that middle floor, which creates a sense of generosity. And that sense of generosity is something that we also tried to tap in many of our projects. That is that, you know, you aren't just another cog in a formulaic wheel that is based on regulations. We are reading the regulations and we are, you know, abiding by every single piece that is in the law, but we are interpreting it and reinterpreting it to the point where we're, we're winning or gaining more value for the occupant of the unit and sharing that with with everyone else in those wider corridors. So that's a that's a great example of a very early project with a, a sort of history lesson as well as a new interpretation in a Scandinavian kind of um, world. Well, and you're very much in that case an advocate for the user of the building. So when I think about a project like Copen Hill, right, which is where you all created a community amenity from a piece of infrastructure. And for people who are not familiar with it, you were asked originally, I believe, to do a uh, waste to energy treatment facility. And you had this wonderful creative idea of turning it into an artificial ski slope and a, an attraction and an amenity that the community could use. Now, people certainly didn't ask for that, but somehow I guess that's where the balance comes in, in your view of delivering a better future while at the same time having something that serves the community well. It, it's a really great example of that. And I would say that uh, we all possess that ability to read a design brief or a competition brief and look at it with a, a set of eyes that really starts to you know ask ourselves how have we actually set up the rules for our current life and what are the set of rules that we feel we should abide by in the future so in the instance of power plants these are built sometimes with the largest budgets of any building form on the planet yet they are typically fenced off areas on a map. They are gray. There's no life uh, around them because no one wants to live around a power plant. And 
So you get a lot of nimbyism whenever there's an announcement of there's going to be a power plant built here. So we were we realized that that was the task. And the task was to somehow find a way for the power plant to be most pleasantly received to the nearby residents. And we felt that the best way to do that was to actually engage with that population. And instead of building a fence to welcome them. And once we welcomed the citizens, we asked ourselves, like, what types of programs are they in the lack of? And it became pretty clear it was going to be a very active recreational lifestyle. And then when you consider that, you know, Denmark is one of the flattest countries in Europe, for them to ski anywhere, they have to drive eight plus hours to northern Sweden or to Switzerland. And so by actually creating this artificial hill, one of the tallest places or spots in the country, we could start to activate it. And we could start to have the power plant serve as a recreational facility. Now, that all sounds bananas, but the director of the plant actually saw something that we didn't even see, which is that she would typically probably have to pay lawyer fees against all of the lawsuits that would start to pop up on all the residents that would don't want the power plant there. And instead of spending all this mindless cash on the lawyer fees, she knew that this power plant would be well received and that it would not have the same legal liability or challenges. So she could take the very same money she would have spent fending off everything and instead investing it into the community. And I think that those kinds of situations occur a lot with development because there's a lot of negativity around it and there are a lot of NIMBYs and there's a lot of gentrification conversations. If we can start to think about those types of discussions and find ways for us to build more bridges between communities and needs, we're going to have a much easier time developing. It's almost as though you imagined all the potential negative impacts or a negative relationship that a community could have with a project, and you just inverted it and asked the question, how could we create something that attracts as opposed to repels? Exactly. And we do that a lot on many of the projects because they have similar issues. And, you know, it could be something as simple as just the mobility access to a site and rethinking how a street is laid out can suddenly really uh, turn a project 180 degrees from something that's too difficult to something that is uh, manageable. And it's just asking certain questions. We uh, have another example here in uh, New York, in Harlem. It was a pretty basic site that would have required a double loaded corridor. Actually, there were previous schemes on the site It's a mid-block site, so you don't have the abilities to do corner kind of uh, anchors. And so as a mid-block site, it became very clear that you could only do this uh, double-loaded corridor and that the units towards the inside would be just not such great units. We asked a simple question because in the 1916 building code, which actually was the first building code in this country, United States... And you, you typically get this sort of wedding cake architecture uh, where you go a certain distance up, you set back a little bit, and then you do the same uh, the higher you go. And that New York kind of tower style of wedding cake architecture was never challenged in 100 years. We came along and we kind of asked the question, well, if, if, it's, if it's not a certain distance up and a certain distance back... What then is the law actually uh, requiring? And we learned that it was a volume of space. Why then would you take away the volume from the highest floors where you could have more units or more square footage? So we scalloped the entire facade so that you are taking certain square feet away at the lower floors that you would then gain at the top floors. 
that has created what is now a project called the Smile because the entire building facade looks like a smile. And that's just a reinterpretation of a hundred year old building code. Because again, we just asked the question, what is the intent of the law? And could we now actually communicate it in a different way? And that created more square footage up in the higher floors where you do have more views. And we also did a second thing where we, instead of just keeping it a bar building, we added a T shape to it. So it actually added another 30% uh, more units. Those two things suddenly unlocked that site as never before. And uh, that's what uh, I think the, the client in this case, Blumenfeld, was, was really happy about. You know, it's interesting we talk about clients because so many of these projects you're talking about where you've, you've really taken such an unusual approach and come up with sometimes very novel design solutions. You know, big is seen by many as having this unprecedented amount of creative freedom and they have the impression that uh, clients are fully understanding and supportive of everything you do from the very beginning uh, and it allows you the situation uh, to do these extremely creative projects. Well, how much of that reputation is built around reality and how much is there, let's say, education and negotiation with the client about these unusual approaches you want to take? Uh, that's a great question, and 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 certainly I can answer it only in that it's it is a negotiation. There is nothing that's just flat out. I think um, big saying it should be so, and somehow that is what is done. I think that a lot of clients actually seek us out for that conversation and negotiation because, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Larry Page who hired both big and. Thomas Heatherwick to design the new Google headquarters in Mountain View. And uh, that that was a, I would say, you know, a client that challenged us just as much as we perhaps challenged him and them. That was a chance to really develop, uh, I'd say, close to 30 new building systems because there was just a continual desire to find new solutions to kind of age old issues. Uh, so when it came down to sort of uh, photovoltaic uh, and knowing that we wanted to integrate photovoltaics into the, into the roof, but photovoltaics as a product had sort of remained quite unchanged from the first, probably in the sixties and seventies uh, integration into, uh, into buildings. And they were quite clunky and they would require a sort of, you know, set, flat roof to, to sort of administer them. Maybe you could get away with a few angles here and there, but you wouldn't have design freedom. And uh, we discovered a white paper uh, that some uh, PhDs had written to create a sort of thinner wafer of photovoltaic with a much smaller kind of uh, back uh, of house. And then we put them in touch with St. Gobain, the glass manufacturer, and together they they worked on a product uh, which was was then tested and inspected over a year, year and a half to just have a client that is able to take that kind of a journey with you is remarkable. And I think that, you know, that again is where it was a back and forth and allowed us to really create an entirely new building system and product for construction. And I would say that those are the best examples. Uh, Douglas Durst, and the Durst family, a similar kind of negotiation on, on the VIA project, our first project here in the United States. Ian Gillespie, someone who we work with a lot, uh, West Bank, across you know eight, nine projects. Uh, each one is, is a kind of conversation. And uh, those are the projects where I think they're extremely successful. And, and that's everything is, is a conversation because it, you know, the budget certainly comes to mind. But uh, so do the processes of of regulatory processes and the and the and the permitting that you need to get. And there are many many issues that come along the way. That is a, a constant conversation. So for clients, economic returns are going to be a big part of many many projects. 
How openly do you consider the economic returns of a project or the economic returns of a particular design approach when you are coming up with your solutions and how big a part of the conversation with clients is economic return? Yeah, I think it's a part of the conversation. It's not the only part. I do believe that um, there are many points of the conversation, which can also be just the how people will receive the project and how easy it may be to actually go through permitting, you know, what the construction timelines are. Those are, of course, all have ramifications on the budget in the end as well. But, you know, we got our start on a sort of design build projects. They were, uh, the contractor was our client. And I think when you uh, both, you know, come from Scandinavia and you are also budget driven, that is always a very important element. I I would say that we probably, you know, produce anywhere from 100 to 150 affordable housing units a year over the past 10 years, if you take all of our affordable projects and add them together. That's as important to us as it is to work on projects like the, the Prague Philharmonic or the Tennessee Performing Arts Center that was just announced. To, to us, it's the ability to use our design thinking to the budget, to those needs, and to work within that. There's currently a quest. We are partnered with Icon, the 3D print company out of Austin, Texas. And there's a kind of moonshot competition going on to see if one can build a a single family dwelling that would typically be $170,000 to $180,000 construction cost and build it with 3D printing and bring the price under $100,000. And, and that's as much of an interest for us partnering with Icon, investing in Icon, uh, because it actually addresses issues of affordability at, at many different levels. And that to us is, is extremely exciting as we move forward. Yeah, addressing issues of affordability, but not sacrificing anything in terms of the user experience. Or looking at just advancements in construction. So we uh, were working design-wise across many sectors, uh, landscape design. We engineer uh, some of our own buildings. We do, of course, the architecture, the interiors, product design. So this, this idea of a holistic design service inside and out and, and beyond is, is really, really important. And then how do buildings get put together? So the constructability of them as well. Great. Well, I've just got one last question for you. What is the design industry missing in the way it looks at and explains the value of design? Uh, I have something that I would really love for the design community to uh, see a value in. And that is actually something that was around in the 60s and 70s. uh, And you'll remember this probably is post-occupancy evaluations. Oh, yeah. And I think that we're too obsessed about taking on the next project or doing the next you know, thing than to actually look at the projects that we have completed or recently completed, kicking the tires, and then seeing how those could then be tweaked perhaps to actually also be uh, more refined and that we still have a service which should be a kind of, you know, after CA and after we feel that we've completed the project, that there is the chance over a month or two to reevaluate the success of the initial kind of thinking. We would then, of course, also rely on a lot of sensors collecting data, and we would be able to kind of position and reposition uh, spaces according to where uh, the needs are. And this tweaking phase is something I think would demonstrate that, you know, A, we care about what we design, B, we would engage more with the user, the end user, than we probably did at any point and stage of the design process, because we would have to interview them and hear how they like or, you know, dislike the building and and how we can actually increase performance. 
So I think it's too rarely done. Uh, and it's just something that I think is totally untapped. Well, and it really changes the way that architects often traditionally look at a building, which is to get it to the point where essentially the ribbon is cut, it's handed over to the client, and then on to the next project. Sticking through with the ideas and seeing how they actually are received uh, would, would be very gratifying. Absolutely. Well, Kayuva, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. Uh, it has been a delight to talk to you, and thanks for being on This is Design Intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of This is Design Intelligence. The producer is Laura Spells. The sound engineer is Jared Knabel. This has been a DI Media Group production.